the analysis of technological metalworking processes, modeling techniques are very useful. Theoretical as well as experimental models are used for predetermination of flow patterns, strain distributions, and the forces acting on the tools. This, for example, is a physical model of the forward extrusion process. The model material is plasticine, which matches the flow properties of metals quite closely. As an example of theoretical analysis, let us first examine the plane strain upper bound method. Since this extrusion process is symmetrical, it is sufficient to consider only one half of the process geometry. The principle of the upper bound method is that we guess a deformation pattern which is kinematically permissible. It is assumed that the velocity of any material particle changes only when the particle is crossing one of the red lines in the upper bound field. The aim of our analysis is to calculate the amount of work necessary for the deformation to proceed. Let us look at an example. This is a model of the plane chip cutting process. The material moves towards the stationary tool and the chip is formed. Notice that the chip is slightly thicker than the depth of cut. Also notice that a distinct shear zone exists between the tip of the tool and the surface of the material. Most of the deformation takes place within this narrow shear zone. The shear zone is also clearly to be seen on this etched section of an actual metal cutting process. Here again, the chip is thicker than the cutting depth. In this model, the material is replaced by a stack of cards. The material velocities on either side of the shear zone are represented by vectors 0 to 1 and 0 to 2. Drawing these two vectors from the same origin produces the shear velocity in the direction of the discontinuity line, vector 1, 2. This velocity diagram is called the hodograph. Here are the two elements in the stack of cards. The leading element is deformed when it passes through the shear zone. We identify the corners as A, B, C, and D, and A, B, C, and D prime. Superimposing these elements, we see that the work done per unit width, delta A, is equal to the yield shear stress of the material, K, multiplied by the length, B, C, and the distance moved, C, C prime. The time, delta T, taken for the element to pass the discontinuity, is equal to CD over V. The rate of work then becomes delta A divided by delta T. Let's recapitulate this derivation. Here is the hodograph. Here are the undeformed and deformed elements, and here is the expression for the rate of work. The two hatch triangles are similar and therefore the ratio C, C prime to C, D is equal to the ratio U to V, where U and V are the velocity vectors earlier denoted by 1, 2 and 0, 1. Thus we get this expression. B, C is equal to the length of the line of discontinuity, which we denote S. The rate of work per unit width can then be written as S, U, K. If there are several discontinuities in the guess deformation pattern, we get the work by simple summation. The result is fundamental to the plane strain upper bound method. We shall demonstrate the application of the upper bound method with a simple example. Here is a house. Under certain circumstances, the house may start to sink due to the deformation of the ground. We will calculate an upper limit to the pressure, P, necessary to make the house sink. Let us assume this deformation pattern. We then have a semicircular upper bound field. The ground line of the house is 2A. The radius of the circle is R. The length of the line of discontinuity is pi times R. The rate of external work is pi times 2A times the velocity of the house. The rate of internal work is calculated from the expression S times U times K.
putting the two rates of work equal to each other, we get this expression for P, which is minimum when R is equal to the ground line 2A. This makes the value for P over 2K equal to pi. Thus, the semicircular deformation pattern yields P over 2K equal to 3.14. Let us see how more realistic deformation patterns will influence this value. For this triangular field, P over 2K becomes equal to 3. Adding the symmetrical left-hand side does not change our result. By dividing the field into more triangles, we find P over 2K equal to 2.67, or 2.61. And with an infinite number of triangles and the two fans, we find P over 2K equal to 2.57, which corresponds to the so-called slip line solution. Slip line theory is in itself a widely used analytical method for cases of plane strain deformation. These lines take the direction of the maximum shear stresses, and there are two orthogonal sets of lines, shown here by red and black lines. We now return to the upper bound method in order to see how this theory can be used to determine the movement of particles and the deformation of a square grid. Firstly, the paths of horizontal lines are drawn. In each region, they follow the direction of the velocities. Then the vertical lines will be drawn. To do this, we study the path of a particle across a line of discontinuity. The particle moves from A to B and would have arrived at point D except that after point C, it is forced to follow the line CE. Instead of distance CD, the particle then covers distance CE in the same interval of time. Point E is found by using the hodograph. The triangle CDE is similar to the hodograph, which shows that our construction is correct. In this way, the deformation of the vertical lines can be drawn. Let us now look at another model material, slip line wax. This is a wax of a special composition which exhibits color changes along lines of maximum shear stress. Here we simulate the blanking process in which two identical slip line fields appear on the surface due to the special properties of this wax. Returning to forward extrusion, we will now combine several methods in order to analyze this process. This is an experiment with slip line wax. The extrusion shown here takes place with 50% reduction through a 30 degree taper. The slip line field looks like this, and we arrive at this straightened out field for upper bound analysis. For identification, the regions of the field are numbered, and we proceed to construct the hodograph. The entry velocity, naught one, equal to V, is drawn first and extended, since we know that the exit velocity is also horizontal. Then the velocity of each region is found by drawing lines parallel to the lines of discontinuity in the field. Now that the hodograph has been drawn, we can determine the theoretical deformation of any square of the grid entering the extrusion. We draw the horizontal lines, and using the same method as before, we draw the vertical lines. In order to compare the results from upper bound theory with our physical model, we here extrude plasticine through a 30 degree taper. The reduction is 50%. The deformation takes place under plane strain conditions between plates of steel and glass. A five millimeter square grid has been painted on the red plasticine. The plasticine is a scale model of actual metals and its properties can be chosen so as to resemble those of various metals. Notice that the deformation pattern gradually stabilizes. Near the die, two discontinuity lines develop. They are orthogonal and are both inclined at 45 degrees to the symmetry axis. Here, the experimental grid is compared with the grid from upper bound analysis. There is good agreement between the two networks.
The slip line field for 50% reduction through a 30 degree taper is particularly simple. It can be developed for similar extrusions where reductions are less or greater than 50%. These two new fields are straightened out into upper bound fields. Next, the theoretical deformed networks are constructed, and they look like this. We now conduct the corresponding experiments using our model material as before. This is a 25% reduction. The taper angle is maintained at 30 degrees. Notice that it takes a while for the deformation pattern to stabilize. The extrusion process belongs to the class of stationary processes characterized by the existence of the same deformation zone throughout the process. But of course, the process is not stationary at the beginning or at the very end. Comparing experimental and theoretical results for this case, we find very good agreement. Next, let us consider extrusion with a 60% reduction. The taper angle is still 30 degrees. In this case, very large distortions of the grid take place. Notice that the two lines of discontinuity near the die opening show very clearly. Here again, they are inclined at 45 degrees to the axis of symmetry. You can actually see the change in velocity at these lines. With this large reduction, it takes quite some time for the process to become stationary. Even in this case, we find satisfactory agreement between experiment and the upper bound theory.